You're ready to go? Awesome. Awesome. Ready to go. So very many of you sat through the, the, the last one there. I hope I didn't bore you. Uh, this talk is uh, Minutes of the Human Brain. And, and yesterday when we had our meeting of all the speakers and, and all the board members and stuff, you know, the big thing was is going from the soil to animal or plant or to man. And, and you got to make that leap. And I, as a practitioner, am stuck with everybody that's uh, malnutrition, uh, poison from lead, energy, and mercury, and environmental stuff, to uh, complete nutritional deficiency. So minerals in the brain it, it is a very good topic to look at. So I, I see this, the gut-brain axis is what it comes down to. How does something get from your gut, whatever it is you're eating, food or food-like stuff, or however you want to look at some of the stuff that they market to us to stick in our mouth, uh, does it get to the brain? So they are recording this, and there's a lot of people that are going to look at it, so I'm going to go through some of the stuff you've heard. I like to start off all of my speeches with something called the Element Song by uh, Tom Lear. <laughs> And Sam was getting ready to go on a trip. And the Amish don't have cars, so they rent buses and whole families go on trips. And, and, and the season of morel mushrooms had just come and gone. And somebody had given Sam a bag of morel mushrooms. And in that bag was a false morel. False morels are not very good. So Sam's wife cooks this up, the whole family, the night before a big trip. They uh, eat this mushroom and everybody gets sick and throws up because they got a good taste of that bad mushroom. Sam ate the mushroom. And the next day he gets on a bus to go downstate and he goes on what mushroom people call a bad trip. <laughs> Some people laugh, they've been there. No. <laughs> and he does not like the trip and he starts saying all kinds of really off the wall weird things and they're like, oh my gosh, he's possessed or something. And he gets horribly sick, and then they take him back, and they go, he must be depressed. And they put him on Prozac. And the next thing I know, he's down in the Amish home for the depression. And I get in my car with everything I thought I might need. I <coughs> do my research, and I get there, and I go, he's got mushroom poisoning. And when you read about this false morel, this false morel mushroom is used to take manganese and convert it from one state to another, soak it up in the manganese, and detoxify ground in manganese quarry mines. So it has something to do with manganese. Well, one thing leads to another. Um, he, he can't think. His eyes are wild. His breath, you can smell it through a video recording. I mean, it was so bad. Um, and I get his bottles working. I get everything working really good. And he decides he's going to leave this home for the depression because all they got him on is Prozac. And he's starting to feel better in 12 hours. He's going to come home. His wife calls me this day and says, well, higher powers, meaning the church members, said he's got to go to a medical doctor in Midland who put him in the hospital for depression and doubled his Prozac. Yeah. 
So I get out of bed at four o'clock in the morning and I drive two and a half hours to go see Sam. And when I get there, the nurse goes, by the way, there's a doctor here to see Sam. And he refuses to allow me to even see Sam. So I get in my car and I go back home. And then Sam gets so bad that the wings of mercy are called in and they whisk him off to uh, Mayo Clinic. Well, I called the Mayo Clinic and I said, this guy's got mushroom poisoning. It's messed up his manganese levels and it's goofed up his copper levels. And I give him the whole story as I've seen it. When he gets there, they go, he's got mad cow disease. <laughs> and they sent him home and he died in three days from mushrooms. What happened in his gut from these mushrooms that transported to the brain that took a prion molecule that's kept under heavy lock and key because your body has it in the DNA code and released it. Well, it was the transformation of manganese from one form to another that allowed this copper manganese imbalance to, to run wild. So food definitely has to go from the soil to us. And it's got to pass through a series of bacteria from the plant soil to the plant and then we eat the plant and then our gut bacteria has got to rearrange these molecules so there's a lot of problems in the gut and if you experience this it's called the gut brain axis and i'm going to play you a, a, a lady named elaine asco i think she's lecturing to about three thousand doctors and uh, this is very enjoyable It's a place. So, it never ceases to amaze me that each of us carries around a three pound mass of cells in our heads that controls literally everything we do. Importantly, though, the brain doesn't act in isolation from the body, but rather it responds to the needs and experiences of each of our organ systems. Now, here's a staggering statistic that some of you may have heard before. Our bodies are comprised of 10 times more microbial cells than our own human eukaryotic cells. These microbes, which are primarily bacteria, but also viruses and protozoa, they're part of our normal flora, and they make up what's called the commensal microbiome. In the intestines, there are 100 trillion of these bugs reflecting over 10,000 unique species and contributing 150 times more genes than our own human genome. It's even estimated that collectively these microbes would weigh two to six pounds, which is up to twice the weight of an average adult human brain. <laughs> more and more we're learning that these commensal microbes that make up us have co-evolved to play fundamental roles in normal brain development and function. So we can study the role of commensal microbes by raising mice as completely germ-free and recolonizing them with whichever microbes are of interest. And by these types of studies, we're learning that commensal microbes regulate several complex behaviors, like anxiety, learning and memory, appetite and satiety, among lots of other behaviors. So you can see now that by studying this microbrain interaction, we can learn really important lessons about how microbes can contribute or affect our brain health and disease. So you might be wondering, how in the world does a microbe that lives in your gut affect your brain? And there are many different what mechanisms. One way is by activating the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve contacts the gut lining and extends all the way up to the brain stem itself. And this is a mechanism by which the bacterium, called Lactobacillus rhamnosus, affects the human-like <coughs> behavior in mice. So in a task that measures depression-related despair, mice that have been treated with this bug exhibit less depression-like symptoms. And this is not seen if the vagus nerve is severed. Another way by which microbes can affect the brain is by activation of the immune system. So about 80% of the body's immune cells reside in the gut, and immune abnormalities contribute to several neurological disorders. And this is one mechanism by which the bacterium Bacteroides fragilis prevents a mouse version of multiple sclerosis. So mice that have been treated with this bug 
are more resistant to the disease, as shown with by the, uh, the red line in this graph. And this depends on the activity of a special subset of immune cells called regulatory T cells that expresses the marker CD25. So if we block the activity of this immune cell, then the beneficial effects of the bugs are prevented. Another way by which bugs can affect the brain is by activating the gut endocrine system. So gut endocrine cells are primary producers of neuropeptides and neurotransmitters. Gut microbes themselves can also produce metabolites that could affect brain function. And this is one pathway that we think is involved in the microbe-based treatment that we in the um, Patterson and Madmanian labs here at Caltech have used to treat autism-like symptoms in mice. So by treating mice with um, this bacteria and bacteria's fragility, we're able to correct core abnormalities, um, such as the communication deficit that's depicted here. That's a hallmark symptom or diagnostic um, symptom of autism. So here are mice that are autistic-like display less communication as depicted by the blue bar, and treating them with the bug uh, corrects this effect as shown by the red bar. So I think that the implications of these discoveries is huge, because what if we could, without a single invasive procedure, treat disorders like autism, depression, and multiple sclerosis? Microbe-based therapeutics might offer us a way to build a stable community structure that can impart long-lasting effects without the need for a continuous treatment. Also, since microbes are relatively easy to manipulate and even eliminate, they can be readily modified for better functioning, regulatory control, targeting, and even delivery. So as a take-home message, I want you to remember that not only are we made up of mainly microbial cells, but that some of these cells can be truly mind-altering, affecting our brain development, function, and even our behavior. And also, in light of several studies showing important roles of commensal microbes in a variety of biological processes, from nutrition and immunity to now brain and behavior, Consider all the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis to change or disrupt our microbiome and how this might affect our health and predisposition to disease. I think that uh, when you start to see what research is showing, what the bacteria is doing to help us or hurt us is extremely important. So how do minerals get into your brain? Because the topic is minerals in the brain. The University of Calgary was given $90 million to go out and buy expensive American equipment or wherever in the world to come up with the most sophisticated way of looking at anything and finding out what's in it. I stumbled across this database and I found out that they had done blood, saliva, urine, milk, cerebral spinal fluid. And cerebral spinal fluid piqued my interest extremely fast because as a chiropractor, I am in the business of moving vertebrae and letting fluids flow. Your blood pressure is 120 over 80. You add it together, divide by two, you carry about 100 pounds pressure in your arteries as an average. The central nervous system, the cerebral spinal fluid, operates at 20 pounds PSI as a result of this. And the fluid made in the brain travels down the spine and is replenished every eight hours. Quite an amazing feat. It's not like a drop of blood goes through the whole body in eight minutes, but the fluids drain. And they change the way they look at these fluids. In the past year, the textbooks are all being rewritten. That cerebral spinal fluid, A, is going through the lymphatic system, not the venous system. And that changes the outlook as to what a hair test could do to find out what your mineral burdens are because the lymph system is that clear stuff right underneath your skin. And I look at your hair as a way of the body to get rid of toxic materials. I've done, I've done uh, private hairs, I've done armpit hairs, I've done hairs off the back of people's head. Um, and my personal experience was my armpit hair was just laced with cadmium right off the charts. Well, I only quit smoking 28 years ago and that's a very good source of cadmium. To this day, I'm still excreting cadmium. So sometimes we don't just get rid of these minerals because we find them and it takes a long time to get rid of them. 
and it's important to know what the minerals are. So in relation to my buddy that owned a farm feed store, I used to have lunch with him twice or three times a year for 14 years, and he would say, are oh, you still out to try to save the world? And I go, well, one patient at a time or one book at a time, because I hadn't either written any books. I hadn't met Chuck Walters. When I met Chuck Walters, and these salesmen started coming in saying, I understand there's a chiropractor lives in this area. And they pulled my book out, and he, he changed his tune a little bit, and he started carrying Thorvin kelp. He started carrying American kelp. He started carrying organic. And through the movement of going to One Acres Conference, which was the second Acres Conference I went to, I was at this conference. And that morning I went and got milk because I had to leave milk behind for my son and my daughter. And the farmers were about ready to you know, fall off the face of the earth with depression. I said, what the heck happened? Well, our milk is no longer going to Stonyfield out in Connecticut. The trucking company went out of business in a big fiasco, and our milk's going into the local food food supply, which is not organic, trust me. And I, that night I went to the convention, and suddenly I stopped down, I turn around, and here's Dr. Paul Detloff at the Organic Valley booth. I talked to him and tell him what's going on, and he said, Richard, is there any room for expansion? I said, well, I can think of a mile of six farms, and I know there's four farms in Austin, and I can think of about eight more farms that will probably transition and the end of the conversation, the conference ended. I went up and lectured from Midwest Bioleg up in, up in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin. And when I come home, the Cordes brothers were on cloud nine. I go, you guys were going to commit Harry Carey the last time. I said, you what happened? He said, did you hear Organic Valley picked us up? So all these farms in northern Michigan, in the course of a single conversation, all were on the Organic Valley truck and they are to this day. And the organic movement in northern Michigan then became Sam, my, my friend that passed on, was delivering all the organic supplies to these people. And of course, some farms branch out and they go with different people. So when I'm at this Amish depression home in his prayer time, the Amish go around and they each read a verse. Well, this is the verse that ended up in my lap. Every plant that my father, who is in heaven, has not planted will be uprooted. And here I am, you know, really kind of not Amish religious, and I'm going, my gosh, the Bible knows all about GMO. <laughs> <laughs> so that's included in every speech. The genetics of an age. That video shows or implies that 80% of your immune system is the bacteria in your gut. Where, where's the other 20%? The other 20% is the cerebral spinal fluid with 292 things in it. That's what controls the 80%. It's this fluid made in your brain. It travels out every nerve, goes to every part of your body. That <laughs> regulates your immune system. And a single pinched nerve will change the microbiota of your gut. That's been demonstrated. So most of the time I'm really nervous when I start to talk, so I put myself in a nice setting. Um, I ended up buying a float plane and I wanted to go to Canada, and I ended up getting my own lake, and that's the cottage on it. And uh, that's fatty omega threes at its best. <clears throat> I take a few doctors up there, and we go up and chat, and uh, we eat fatty omega threes. I have moose, I have caribou, I have a bird that gets me there. And I've been in practice for 37 and a half years. I initially uh, started treating people at about the age of eight. I would give people massages and they couldn't believe how much better they felt. And that brought a lot of attention to me, so I kept doing it. I set my first rib when I was 15. When I was 18, I got hurt trying to be a pro hockey player. My buddy says, well, you need to be a chiropractor. And I go, what's a chiropractor? He goes, someone that messes with your back and makes you feel better. So I went to this older gentleman and we go in the back door in the front. And the guy's driving a Brooklyn car, which was like $50,000 in 1972. And I was kind of impressed with that, and he puts my back in place, and I stood up, and I said, I can do that. And he looked at me, and he said, you can do what? I said, I could do this. He shook his head. He says, you know, I've invested heavily into a new school called Sherman College of Chiropractic. So within two days, I was on a bus, and I went down there, and I met all these people, and I came back. And then trying to be a professional hockey player didn't work out. I didn't have a Canadian address. I'm not big enough. So I ended up being a referee, which makes a lot of money, and I chose the chiropractic school I go to based on the number of ice rinks that were on the area because I think I'm living. So I graduated chiropractic school with only $15,000 in student loans. So I started treating anything and everything. I don't care, birds, goats, dogs, horses. 
you know, anything that would hold still and I could work on the spine. And to this day, I do that. This is the first trip I've ever gone on and I did not bring my treatment tablet because it would be right here. I just had too many speeches because people line up to get treated. Why? Energy equals mass times the speed of light. When I work on somebody, I can change the mass of the individual and I can change the flow of electricity and make them stand an inch taller in a second. But I don't want to know, okay, why does this work for some and others, and why do people get really sick? So I started looking at the cerebral spinal fluid, and I started looking at minerals, and then I stumbled across a book called Atomic Suicide. I learned about subatomic particles back in the 70s before the atomic reactors were actually doing it. So I have a website, I have a web, I have the largest health food store uh, north of Saginaw, which encompasses about two-thirds of Michigan. Uh, it's strictly organic. There's nothing in there that's that's not organic. And there's nothing coming from China that I'm aware of. Um, and that does limit some people's ability to get to the store because I'm in the 12th poorest county in the country. Uh, we have the highest unemployment rate. Um, and so needless to say, I go on the road to make the store busy. And, and it does work because when I show somebody a soil test, and they go, yeah, well, we already know about that soil test. And they go, well, yeah, well, you're looking for maybe 12 minerals, add five in. I'm looking at 38 minerals in the hair test that we have to get you better from. I'm looking for lead, cadmium, arsenic, beryllium, barium, plus all the good minerals. So we do the hair test and then we set up a protocol to detox and rebuild and in three months you do that hair test again. And in the process you may not have access to fluoride-free toothpaste, fluoride-free dental floss, or whatever your sundries are and we, we do a lot of shipping of that. The book was supposed to be the genetics of an eight. You're supposed to be able to go to drricholry.com and donate $25 and you get the book. But that didn't happen. It's not going to happen until December 15th. It's just the way things work. Um, you, you can trust people to do their jobs, but if you don't pay them enough, they don't do it. <laughs> uh, the health food store can be called. We're open. If I'm open, the health food store is open. It's as simple as that. Uh, because uh, I walk into a room. Everybody's got a tale of what's going on. I look them over from top to bottom. I mean, the first thing I do is I look up their eyes. If their eyes are bloodshot, I know they're full of inflammation. And we start right off with like, your eyes are very bloodshot. You must hurt all the time. And when they instantly don't say no, they're lying. If they say yes, I say where? We start, I start asking questions. And 90% of the time, I can go back to really stupid stuff in the diet. Diet this, diet that, diet gum. Well, I don't eat diet gum. Well, all gum has aspartame in it, and it causes a terrible thing to happen to you. It makes wood alcohol and formaldehyde. Uh, so we go through a lot of that stuff and try to get people out of inflammation. <clears throat> the first book is Minerals for the Genetic Code. It's on its fourth edition. We really haven't made any changes from any of it. Uh, the second edition, under the selection of minerals, we found that tellurium, which is a good mineral, is found in garlic. But other than that, the books are all identical. Minerals for Tumor Suppressing Gene is a book that we wrote, but I'm just not publishing it. If you think anything I've ever written is technical, this one is so far above anybody's head, it's not worth printing because you would buy it and go, well, what door can we step that next to? Make a doorstop out of it. So I wrote a book that I thought would help a lot of people, like targeting the entire Amish community because they really don't have a nutrition education to speak of in their school districts and their school systems because they only go to school until the eighth grade. You know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. So I wrote a thousand page book on anything and everything that should be in a health food store. And it's really a nice book that was uh, published by um, Lancaster Ag out of uh, Ronks, Pennsylvania. Minerals for Acupuncture Meridians I'm going to release tomorrow. And that book is about the movement of magnetic energy in your body. And if people don't grasp magnetic energy, take the battery out of your car and set it on the cement for a week and see if it works because your car batteries go dead. This movement of magnetic energy out of these storage units are quite notable. If you ever have to buy flashlight batteries and you see the button that's got about 25 batteries in it, stay away from it because those are about half dead because they drain each other. You gotta buy them in packs of one or two to get them. I'm working on a book called Milk. I own a company called the A1A2 Gene Testing Company. Why? Because my goal was to take one child and keep one child from becoming type 1 diabetic from the morphine that's in milk. Seven beta caseal morphine is laced the whole milk industry. They know it's there, they like it, people get addicted. The United States produces 40 billion gallons of milk a year. They know what to do with that morphine based up, they put it in everything. 
So there has to be a company that's morphine free, and I've been fortunate enough to work with Dr. Paul Detloff in Organic Valley, and in the past seven years, we've gotten 90% of all the cows in Organic Valley tested, and it's a morphine free milk supply for all practical purposes. So people that have allergies to food, going back to something that your brain gets hooked on, morphine, just don't let the children grow up drinking morphinated milk and you won't have a morphine epidemic. It's a big, big problem. It causes autism. So I took a look at this industry and there's a few people that were collecting hair, sending it to Australia to the guy that owned the A2 gene, which no longer happens, and he was making $60 a cow. And I said, well, the only way we're going to take this entire organic belly milk company is to get it down to cost. Susie runs my health food store, and I said, Susie, find out what it's going to cost us. And she comes back and tells me, and I said, okay, we charge $1 to get a cow tested, and we're going to make a dollar a cow instead of 60 That means nobody else is going to be doing it, we're going to have all the business. And I did that, and then the A2 gene was owned by somebody until the Supreme Court made a decision, so I shielded all of the farmers from the knowledge of their database of cows to the A2 milk corporation. So as far as the A2 milk corporation, I don't know where this guy keeps buying cows, but you know, he's up to 6,000 cows now. The Supreme Court came along and said, you cannot own a gene, but if you see it and tweak it, that's man-made and you can own it. So when that was out of the way, I got off the hook because they could have nailed me since I don't have cows, they could have nailed me for a lot of money, who knows? Thank you. Yes, sir. So I got that under control with that, and we still test to this day. Once it got deregulated, there are other labs out there doing it that are actually cheaper than what I'm doing it uh, because I'm still sending mine overseas, and these other labs have opened up in Nebraska and one in California, and, and people have caught on to this A1A2 morphine deal. <coughs> but as far as I know, the only clean milk supply would be uh, milk. So when I started looking at the same database that cerebral spinal fluid came out, I looked at milk and I was floored that there's 1,272 distinct individual things in milk, 900 different kinds of oils. And I'm like, you know, you think a 10W30 or a 20W50 that goes into your car is a multi-blend, to think that oil has 900 blends, it just blew me away. And then when you go into the store and you see all the the fat-free, the 2%, the 10%. I mean, milk has got oils for a reason. You take all the oils out of it and just give people a bunch of sugar, it's not a very good thing. And then have the sugar be laced with morphine, that's even a worse thing. And it causes your gut to do what? It causes the wrong bacteria to grow, and then you get leaky gut. And all these metabolites in your gut designed to go into the toilet end up into your system, or possibly end up into your brain, and that generates a lot of problems. And then also the book uh, on the brain, I found out that boron is the second most abundant mineral in cerebral spinal fluid. And that to me was like an eye popper. And that's what prompted me to write another book, which I'm in the process of writing right now, is, with, is, is on boron. And only in the past three years has all the really good research on boron starting to come out. Um, it just floored me. Okay, if this is the second most abundant mineral in the brain, you know, why? What's it doing? I mean, there's no research on this to speak of, and here it's the second most abundant mineral. So I started thinking, and minerals have electrical charges, and calcium and magnesium are two minerals with the same charge, and when you push them together, they push apart because they're like two north magnets being pushed. Sodium and potassium push apart and stuff like that go together. And that's a plus one is sodium and potassium, plus two is calcium and magnesium. And then here you got the brain full of a positive three boron. It's like this, this stuff that's replenished every 12 hours, it leaks out of the brain, all through the nervous system, to all points in the body, and there's nothing. Well, the research comes out that it attaches to certain molecules. And I sell a, something called SAMe in the health food store. I don't know if anybody's even heard of SAMe. I'm looking at it, I don't know what it is. It turns on that SAMe turns on 159 genes. Boron turns SAMe on. Boron tells vitamin D how to make calcium work. If you have too much vitamin D in your system because you poisoned yourself, you take boron, it goes away. If you don't have enough vitamin D in the winter and you can't get your hands in vitamin D, you take boron, your body starts to make vitamin D 
from boron. So I thought that was a real fascinating way to start to looking at it. And then it turns out that it has a tremendous influence on phosphorus. Well, in the cerebral spinal fluid, there's over 4,000 genes that operate from phosphorus. The backbone of DNA is something called ribosugar. Ribosugar and boron go hand in hand. <coughs> Just absolutely hand in hand. And when they take a look at people that have advanced images of, of Alzheimer's, and you take a look at 781 different brains, you know what they found was missing was ribose. Ribose and boron go hand in hand. It was just like, okay, well, ribose isn't there because the boron's not there. So what displaces that boron? It's the most abundant mineral in the brain. And what's it getting displaced from? Aluminum. Now, calcium and magnesium have these really strong reactions, but boron is there to magnetically repel. A battery drains from magnetic induction, but a boron causes magnetic repulsion. <laughs> It's just constantly there trying to keep aluminum from getting in. This was, um, of course, when the World Trade Towers went down, everybody knew what they were doing. And what I did is bought a ticket to Ground Zero. Yes, sir. Can we ask questions now? Absolutely. Or you prefer later? And no, I prefer every question. OK, so you said that uh, boron uh, helps uh, in the production of vitamin D. If you are vitamin D deficient and you can't, yeah, you take boron in your body and start making vitamin D. So boron, if you're vitamin D, is what we should be taking for vitamin D deficient? Well, you can do it that way. You're better off to take vitamin D and boron because boron needs direction to tell calcium what to do. And boron, boron is a mineral that if you're deficient, you waste magnesium. If you waste magnesium, you cannot retain calcium. When you take boron, your kidneys start recycling magnesium and it allows you to bring your calcium levels back up. Without boron, you don't retain magnesium. If you lose all your magnesium, which is a plus two charge, you're going to lose all your selenium, which is a negative two charge. You lose your cohesion. Magnesium is found in the spinal cord. It's found in all your muscle spindles. Calcium causes things to contract. Everything makes magnesium release. Boron keeps these minerals in you. It's water soluble. It's like a B vitamin. When you take your B vitamins, oh, look, there's yellow urine. You know you did B2 or something in B vitamins that makes you yellow. Boron's water soluble. That's why you have to put it on your farms every five years because it evaporates. It winds away. It's water soluble. but disappears. It's also water soluble in the human body. So when you take a lot of boron, first place it goes is it fills up the cerebral spinal fluid, then it spills into your bones, and then it goes to the kidneys. Those are the primary three sites for boron. And boron excretion is through the kidneys. That's where there's a lot of it in there. And boron is an antiseptic. So boron can kill lots of bacteria. Boron is particularly favored to keep funguses and molds at bay. I couldn't tell you how many people have fungus and mold problems. They come in and their eyes are all black and they got water in their house and their guts and their bodies full of fungus. They kind of like look like they're half rotted off. That's fungus. People will say, well, that's good. I'm getting rid of it. I'm like, I don't know. That's an indication you got it. So putting people and keeping people on boron and uh, quite a bit of it. I mean, the average Korean diet has 71 milligrams a day. It's water soluble. Nobody gets sick from taking this stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it is real. They don't have enough for this problem because they have boron. Israel has the highest boron on the soil in the country, in the world, and the incidence of arthritis is less than one percent, statistically. In in uh, Jamaica, they have the lowest boron levels and they have the highest arthritis in the world. It is the arthritic medicine. So who who knows what, who knows what turmeric is? The extract of turmeric is curcumin. That's a boron delivery system. That's why the stuff works so good. Yes, dear. Um, is it because of the kimchi, the cabbage, or something? Why did they have such a low boron level in Korea? I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the thing is, is that people, uh, it, when you when you go to your grandchildren's or children's events, you've got the really gifted children that can 
run the floors and their hand or your coordination is just absolutely fantastic. And then you got the ones that are tripping when they're trying to walk or run. Hand eye coordination is a boron based deal. Your short term and long term memory is dramatically changed from boron. And you could call a boron the loving pill because if a woman in her older age becomes boron deficient, Testosterone goes down, estrogen goes really high, they dry up and go, oh, well, poor him. You put them on boron, that estrogen comes down, the testosterone goes back up, and they become more loving again, so to speak. Any man with an elevated PSA has a boron problem. Boron and PSA are directly linked. Okay, what's boron? Well, my PSA is going up. Oh, I must have prostate cancer. Let's keep going to the doctor and watch it go up. Oh, start taking some boron and watch it come down. But this is where the research is going with that one particular mineral. I'm an adrenaline junkie. In the last speech, we talked about minerals for the genetic code, and where we put boron was thoracic nine discs, the nerve to the adrenaline gland. What is the adrenaline gland? It's actually a piece of brain sitting on top of your kidneys. So if you're going to get pulled over, your adrenaline instantly flows at the spark of a second. How does it go all through your body at the spark of a second? It's because your adrenaline glands and boron is the mineral that controls the cerebral spinal fluid and has profound effects on the adrenaline glands. So you hear people say, well, my adrenaline glands are fatigued. Well, do a hair test. You probably don't have any boron in your body. If you have boron, you may have really high aluminum. That guy was all pissed off that I was walking around ground zero. I said, here, let me take your picture. He smiled and walked away from me. <laughs> this was one of my colleagues who was abruptly out of business that day. The one fire house that got completely destroyed and everybody's life was taken. This was the new firehouse. These are all the people that were in there. So I managed to get myself around ground zero. I went there three times, so I spent three weeks in ground zero. This was an interesting place because every religion in, in New York had a pastor, a priest, or a church representative because when they brought body parts in, they didn't know what their religion was, so they all prayed over it. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. And you got to clean yourself up pretty good coming out of there. So when you went through the food line at the St. Paul's Church, you turned a corner with your food, and there were all the chiropractic benches, and I treat every walk, firemen, cut place, unions, you name it. They would set their food down, and this was one of the gentlemen that I treated. And this was uh, to only get a picture where there wasn't thousands of people. I had to go out at 4 o'clock in the morning to get this picture, as the memorials were just everywhere. And my work site is where George Washington used to pray. Because that is right on the plaque right behind me for three weeks. Innate exists or belongs to everybody present in an individual from birth, it's inborn, innate behavior. It's your genetic code. If you're a farmer and you're trying to get your genetic code to work really good, one of the indicators would be a brick reading. Well, is your sugar content high enough that the pests won't eat it? Because if they got the sugar high enough, the pests won't eat it and they get sick. How do insects actually work? Insects have antennas. It's like when Clinton says, no, you can't have analog TV. You've got to go to digital. I've got to go buy a new antenna. And my antenna don't pick that up. Or if I've got UHF, I've got to have this antenna. Or if I'm a ham operator, I've got to have this antenna. Because they have different antennas for every frequency. Well, insects got this down for a long time. Every antenna on an insect picks up a frequency that they're looking for for them to consume. And if you have a full-fledged piece of apple, and it's fully mineralized, and you got all your genetic expression, that antenna doesn't pick up anything. It doesn't look at it as an apple. We look at it as an apple. We don't care if we cut it in half and it doesn't brown, or do we? Who's the apple grower? Yeah. There we are. I went to an apple growing, I got invited down to Mexico, and I went to the apple growers of Mexico. And here's a big room with all the apple growers, and they had me speak. And I says, you know, I'm not too sure that you really need Michigan State and you need uh, Washington State and Cornell down here pushing all these rootstocks. Because what they do is they take a big pie and they go, look, one quarter of the pie is the sun, one quarter of the pie is nutrition, 
Oh, the biggest one is your workers. This is how your money supply is. And then they put the Woodstock up there and it's 99% oh, all right, Woodstock. You don't need water, you don't need employees. And it gets everybody to jump on the bad wagon. I said, you know what you need? I said, you need minerals. They said, you need to get some of the minerals out of the ocean. You know, spray it on a foliar spray. The only people that spoke English shunned me. And I'm in Mexico, I can't talk to anybody. They put us on a bus, they took us up to Copper Canyon, and I'm in a van. Seats are crowded except my seat. They weren't even allowed to sit in this seat, which I thought was great. I just sat back and slept. <laughs> I got into the mountains and I got really, like, no oxygen. Didn't like that at all. Couldn't wait to come back down. So I got the way down, but they wouldn't even talk to me. I, I mean, they put the shot on me because I was not there to push genetics. And this lady comes up to me, and through the interpreter, she said, well, We'd be honored if you would come to the apple growers of, of Mexico, but it's the organic version. And you're the guest host. And I go, oh, absolutely. You paying? <laughs> so I ended up going down there, and the home of the Mexican Revolution, I stayed at the great-grandson's house. And it's not like Michigan, where Michigan was the first state to pass a law that says, you can't stop anybody from putting around a pump. No township, no city, no municipality. Nobody can tell you you can't use Roundup on your fields. Down there in that town, all that stuff is outlawed. What a completely different. And I learned a lot from them. I mean, I, I found out that, you know, I go, what's that white paint? You know, well, that's paint, it keeps something off of it. They're painting aluminum on trees. And I went, well, trees absorb a lot of aluminum. I mean, it's the second, third most abundant mineral in the soil, but it's not in the fruit, it's just in other parts of the trees. Um, so I started looking at other things. I said, see, they make tobacco, those little white things that they call papers, hell, that's 50% aluminum. These people are smoking cigarettes or catching <clears> aluminum on fire along with the tobacco and all the other stuff, they're inhaling aluminum. I know it's really a nice thing to think about. But it was nice to go to a town where it was nothing but organic. And the Apple Growers Association there was completely different. I mean, the environment was night and day going from big corporates trying to push Woodstock. And I was sitting right next to the guy that developed that gene that now you cut an apple in half, it doesn't brown. I, what purpose does that serve? That you can cut it in half and it doesn't brown in a week? <laughs> Going back to insects with antennas, getting the right trace minerals in your soil only will ensure that maybe my gut bacteria can get the trace minerals out. What trace minerals do we need? In the brain, we have a lot of stuff. 350 plus stuff. I'm like, okay, how do I write a book about this? So I databased every gene associated with all 352, and this is my summary. Minerals control through the cerebral spinal fluid 7,000 plus genes. Well, I guess milk, if it's got 900 oils, it would only make sense that oils is number two. Protein is three, hormones, vitamins, energy, sugar. Yeah, well, there you go. Eight, uh, December 15th, this book will be available for you to support my research. And once you do that, behind the scene, you'll be granted access because one in two men are dying, and one in, one in two, and one in 2.5 women are dying of cancer. So I am in the process of writing a book on 204 cancers. But it's not a big, thick book, it's an individual book for each form of cancer. And the word cancer cells committing suicide is called apoptosis. So I go into PubMed.gov and I put the name of the cancer and I put apoptosis and I look at all of the genes and all of the products that get cancer cells to commit suicide. So then I put in resveratrol, turmeric, ginger, selenium. I got a list of 50 things and then those that give me a response and then I create a book from where you need to spend your money from the most important to the least important. So if you have stage four pancreas cancer and your days are very numbered, and you only got a limited amount of dollars and you're gonna go to a health food store, do you think the lady that can't tell you anything is gonna tell you what to do? Not really. Uh, and then, But this list gives you exactly where the research is and where you should be spending your money to try to bring your immune system around as fast as possible to commit suicide on the cells. And I'm taking this book on the road and I'm marketing myself to all chiropractic associations in the world and going in and lecturing and then offering that service to the people that are in the healing arts. That's what that website 
Um, let's see, CFS substances. What is actually a genetic standard chart? This is not the CFS substances. This is a, a 70 kilogram person. All the different minerals that they currently have found that seems to uh, be in literature. And I thought I had everything opened up, and I didn't. Okay, this is a... Uh, well, I don't see it now. Do I? It's in the middle right now. Oh, there it is. So, 1,159 genes is water. You know how many water tests I do based on a hydro mineral analysis? Well, everybody that has arsenic, everybody has uranium, everybody has lead or aluminum. Because if um, Peter calls me up and says, Dr. Lori, um, I don't know where that arsenic is coming from. I don't eat rice, because a lot of people eat a lot of rice, get a lot of arsenic. I don't eat rice. I says, Peter, we better get your wife's hair tested. And when it comes back, red line arsenic, then we have to play a detective. Well, that's not hard. Get your water checked. And we find it water all the time. In this neck of the woods, and very far from here, almost to the Mississippi, nine million homes that have groundwater have arsenic in it. And you need to know it, because it's a very slow thing to get out, and it's very well known what cancers you get. And if it's in your water, you have to spend the money to get it out if you don't want to enjoy the sickness of arsenic. Are you talking about, sorry, are you talking about like well water? Yep. People go, oh, I've got good taste of well water. And I go, oh, really? So what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because you can see through the bottle doesn't mean it's water. So I have people get their water tested and find out what's in it. It's like, okay, very good. You know, there's some things we can live with. There's a lot of things you don't necessarily want to get. Lead, <laughs> arsenic, all these different things. You've got to get rid of that stuff if you find it. So if a person calls me up, if Peter calls me up and I'm sitting there, Peter, hey, how's it going today? By the way, what city do you live in? And he says, oh, I live in Ashbury, New Jersey. I'm in Google going, city of Ashbury, New Jersey, Department of Public Works, water supply, and I pull up the water quality report while he's telling me about where he lives. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think I like your water supply too much. It appears that you have, what, arsenic in your water, you have copper, you have this and this, and it's quote acceptable. It might be acceptable for me to go to his house and drink one glass of water, but do I want to put it in my baby bottles? Do I want to shower in it? Do I want to can with it? Maybe not. So water is not water to me in this day and environment because we have got the water supply. Don Huber tells me that 85% of the water supply has Roundup in it. Does reverse osmosis get that out of it? No. Not a good deal. Excuse me. Do the water filters get out arsenic? If you spend $7,000, you can get the right filter. You can get anything out of water at what expense. So you just have to detox yourself you way now? Well, you yeah. Well, where was the largest arsenic poisoning in the world? The World Health Organization went into Bangladesh and said one in five babies makes it to the age five. It's because you take your cattle down there and you drink out of the same river, and the rivers are polluted, and they got dysentery, and they die. So they said, look, here's a pounder, here's some pipe, here's a pump. Nobody checked the water. It's the largest arsenic basin in the world. 34, million, 34 years ago, 39 million people. And you've got those that are sick from the arsenic and dying of cancer. You have those that never got sick. So they started looking at the difference, and they found that folic acid and selenium in the diet made the big difference. So you just look up arsenic. I've been Bangladesh and arsenic. And hit images, and they'll show you. And they'll show you the pumps and the water. I mean, it's, it's, it's all quickly and easily available that arsenic is a big deal with that. On the other hand, a woman can't make a baby boy without arsenic. If you ever meet somebody that's got five girls and has lost five babies, she lost all the baby boys. There's a certain point in gestation that there has to be just enough arsenic to make a baby boy. And when I find these people, I mail them long, thin pine needles from northern Michigan. I mail them three, I have them cut it up and make one cup of tea out of it that's good for five years. And if they're into spontaneous abortion, you can stop it with your hands, just hitting certain key points and putting that in, and you can save a life like that. I don't know how many baby boys. I know some of the baby boys are already halfway to retirement now. 
nonsense because I've been using this since 1982. So water is not water. And if water is 78% of your body, 78% of the people coming through my front door have what a water problem. And if the kidneys don't work right, the quadratus lumborums, deer hunters call them tenderloins, they lock up, tilts the pelvis, gives them back aches 24 seven, goes down their legs, and their life is miserable because they can't sleep, they can't wake up, they can't regenerate. Yes? Where do you send water? Out of doctor's data of Chicago. It's not a prescription. I have it in my store. We can mail it to you, uh, or you can you can have yours sent. It's the same price. Okay. We just have it in the store as a convenience, because if I'm going to do stool and people say, oh, I want to do stool and hair, or, or hair and water, we, we've got it sitting in there. Okay. But I would recommend everybody get the water tested because they're checking for 11 heavy metals. And it's well worth uh, the dollar spent on testing that. Yes, Sydney, you mentioned about how polypathy.